extremely privileged to have our next speaker with us today, Dr. Rod Carr, Chairperson of the Climate Change Commission. Amongst his career, Dr. Carr has served in key leadership roles at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. He led the University of Canterbury as Vice-Chancellor for 10 years and holds a PhD in Insurance and Risk Management, an MA in Applied Economics and Managerial Science, an MBA in Money and Finance and Honours Degrees in Law and Economics. And not least, in 2019, Rod completed his 22nd and 23rd marathons. Most importantly, one in Pyongyang, North Korea, and the other inside the polar circle in Greenland, if you like. Looking forward to hearing from Dr. Carr about the priorities that the Climate Change Commission has given to the government to act on. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carr to the stage. In a mana in a iwi tena koura kato ko Rod Ka aho in a huna mata hairi 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 hoki atu kita huna ora tihe mori ora no mai hare mai kia ora everybody. Um, as a kid, I was a swimmer, not a very good swimmer at school. Um, that's because actually I'm legally blind and catching balls was never my thing. I hated running as a kid. I started running because my brother was sponsoring a fun run in Cromwell in 2002. By the end of 2019, I'd run 20,000 kilometres in training for these marathons, which I used to tag on to international business travel as I went round the world, including one in the Antarctic and one on Easter Island. But that was before I knew stuff about climate change. What I'm going to do is ask you... Um, don't just stand up yet, but I am going to ask you to stand up when you've got your eye and a hand on a piece of paper and a pencil or pen. Because I think this audience will engage in a little bit of competition. <laughs> As I speak to you, I'm going to pepper the conversation with some questions. I want you to jot the answer down, put it down on the table so everybody can see your answer. Then I'll immediately or very shortly thereafter give you the answer to the question. If you got it wrong, sit down. We'll play this game until the table has only got one person left standing. Then the rest of the table can pitch in and help them try and stay standing. <laughs> and when you look around the room and you find there's only one person left standing, please start clapping loudly and they can come and join me on the stage. <laughs> that way I might keep your attention, right? Find a piece of paper. Some of you might want to change tables to find somebody who might know something about this stuff. What will start as an individual competition will then evolve into a team game and finally we'll hopefully have one person standing. Okay, are the rules clear? There is no referee, it's like ultimate frisbee, right? You have to enforce the rules yourselves. Everybody stand and we will start. We're going to cover climate science, climate policy and climate action. We're going to do them all. It's like a pub quiz, right? The chase, right. Humanity has known for some time that the level of different gases in the atmosphere has a different warming effect on the planet and the planet's surface temperatures. When did we first know? When was the first science done? Was it in and around 1800, 1850, 1900, or 1950. On your piece of paper, pick one of those decades. 1800, 1850s, early 20th century, or the middle of the 20th century. And of course, the right answer is that it was in the 1850s. <laughs> the rest of you sit down. It was in the 1850s. Some tables have ruled themselves out already. Okay, order, order. Too much fun already. In the 1850s, a woman scientist, yeah, who guessed that? A woman scientist by the name of Eunice Foote conducted a series of experiments and concluded that carbon dioxide was an effective blanket on the Earth associated with the rise in temperatures. Anyway, 
roll forward the clock a bit, and you think, well, that was a bit of esoteric science, not knowing to many. But in fact, in the Thames newspaper, in which year, was it first common knowledge in New Zealand that two billion tonnes of coal burnt the previous year had in fact created seven billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Was it in 1900, 1912, 1935, or 1960? Pick the year when it was common in New Zealand to know that carbon dioxide <laughs> was warming air. And the answer is, it was in 1912. <laughs> right, so slight reminder of the rules. If you're the last person standing at the table, you can look to your friends to help See if you can figure out the right answer. If you've still got many of you at the same table, you're in it on your own. Anyway, roll forward the clock. In the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson received a report from the petrochemical industry in the United States that laid clear the fact that not only at the current level of combustion of fossil fuels in the open air, but at the rate of increase, planetary temperatures would rise in either the centuries to come, the decades to come, or next year. <laughs> so we got a report by the petrochemical industry, the best scientists on the planet, writing to the President of the United States of America saying, global temperatures would rise in the decades to come. Anyway, time goes forward a little. New Zealand, not always the first mover or early advancer. First in Parliament to talk about climate change was in the 1970s, the 1980s, or the 1990s. Simon Upton mentioned climate change in a parliamentary address in 1986. We got one left standing. Anybody? More than one? Right, let's keep going. In 1990, the United Nations convened a conference acknowledging that this was a problem that no country alone, no industry alone and no emitter alone could possibly help to address. That it needed humanity to respond by first stopping the increase and secondly reducing the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That conference led to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate 1992. Since then, half of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today have been emitted. Not quite in the emergency response yet. Anyway, it is interesting to know that the planet's climate has always changed. This is true. In five billion years of history, we know this planet has had very different climates. In fact, at times, there have been as many as 10 times the current amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than there is today. It is also the case that the temperatures on the planet have gone up and down over the millennia. It is interesting to understand why we are so concerned about temperatures popping above an average increase of 2 degrees Celsius since the latter part of the 19th century, what we call the pre-industrial age, which we've now anchored as around the 1850s as the start, because that's when we really did petroleum. So anyway, yes, temperatures have oscillated between minus 4 degrees Celsius and plus 2 degrees Celsius in the last, pick the number, million years, 10 million years, 
100 million years, 300 million years. How long is it since global surface temperatures averaged more than two degrees above pre-industrial levels? 300 million years. When we bust through plus two degrees, not only have we not been around <coughs> since then, remember trees as we know them turned up 400 million years ago and dinosaurs showed up 260 million years ago. It ain't been that hot for a long time. When you go to bed tonight, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will be the highest level it's been in the last million years. And when you wake up tomorrow morning, it'll be even higher. We are setting a record every day. Not the kind of record that you'd want to be proud of. So the climate science is utterly compelling. It is the result of human activities creating greenhouse gases that is causing the planet to warm. As a consequence, climate is changing. In places, it is warmer and wetter and windier and drier and colder. So calling it global warming has been a bit of a misnomer. We then called it climate change. Perhaps the truth is, it is climate chaos. More and more, those involved in climate science are concerned not about average temperature rises, but about extremes. Current global estimates are that by the middle of this century, and that ain't far away, Northern temperature climates could rise by an average of 6 to 8 degrees centigrade. New Zealand is relatively well placed. It will be a little warmer, wetter, windier and drier, but not by that much. Indeed, Two summers ago, there was a weather station in Antarctica that recorded a temperature 40 degrees Celsius higher than any other recorded temperature there. So it is the extremes that are going to play havoc with our ways of earning a living and the way we live our lives. But here's the truth. We know what's causing the greenhouse gas emissions. About 80% of it is the combustion of fossil fuels in the open air, coal, oil, and fossil gas. About 20%, actually the largest of the rest of it, comes from methane. About half from fugitive gases from the production of oil and gas and leaching from coal mines, and the other half from agriculture. And the two principal sources of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions are ruminant pastoral livestock farming and rice paddies. Because the rotting husks left behind create methane. So when it comes to the challenge of understanding what's going on, there is a bit of misinformation around. One of which is, well, you know, a recent volcano like Mount Etna blowing up 32 years ago created more carbon dioxide emissions than humanity ever has. Not true. That was a meme in 2020 that was immediately denied, but currently in the fact-free void of opinions in Farmers Weekly, it was restated as a fact. The reality is, a serious-sized volcano chucks up about 50 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emission. A fraction of the 55 billion tonnes a year that human activity chucks up. David Attenborough is on record as saying, volcanic activity contributes about 1% of the equivalent human emissions per annum. 
obfuscation, denial, is unhelpful in addressing the reality of how we are causing the climate to change. For New Zealand, setting aside agricultural emissions, our emissions per capita are about eight tonnes for each of us each year. China, including all of manufacturing for the world, is about five tonnes per capita. America's greenhouse gas emissions peaked in 2020, 10, 8, or 5. Is anybody standing? The answer is 2008. Greenhouse gas emissions peaked in the United States. The reality is that globally, even the large emitters are getting on board with reducing greenhouse gas emissions with a wide range of different policy interventions. New Zealand, relatively per capita, is a high-emitting country exclusive of agriculture. We bought some of the oldest, highest-emitting motor vehicles available on the planet. And we bought a lot of them, and we drive them a lot. So 40% of our non-agricultural emissions are from the cars we drive and how we get around and how we move stuff around. So now we move from climate science to climate policy. It is in New Zealand's own self-interest to reduce our emissions, irrespective of what India, China, or Europe do. Why? Because it turns out Renewable energy is cheaper than the alternative fossil fuels. Anybody got an EV? Stick up your hand. You recognised it's about 30 cents a litre to power that thing? Somewhat less than a litre of petrol. More importantly, walking, bike riding, busing, sharing transport, and using low emissions vehicles is an action each and every one of us can take in our own households that will make us better off, as well as improving the lives of others. The fallacious argument that because New Zealand's emissions are so small and total, it wouldn't matter what we did, is highly problematic for the simple reason there are a hundred countries in the world like us who could use that argument but together, our emissions are equal to those of China. More importantly, one tonne of greenhouse gas emissions from you, or me, today, or tomorrow, or from New Zealand, or India, has exactly the same effect on the climate. One tonne of carbon dioxide is one tonne of carbon dioxide. You might not be able to change what India does, you can sure as hell change what you do. And it makes as much difference as if an Indian family that only has emissions of half of ours per capita makes a saving. So dwelling a little on transport in the context of your sector, yes, flight. Flight does matter. What can you do? You can know and understand the footprint of flying. Those of you who are still standing, how many kilograms of carbon dioxide are emitted per hour of flight per passenger on a full plane, 747-400, flying from Auckland to LA? Per passenger, per hour. Is it? 9 kilograms, 90 kilograms, or 900 kilograms per hour per passenger. 90 kilograms of carbon dioxide per passenger per hour for long-haul flight. It's actually a little bit less for domestic short-haul flight because you're not carrying as much fuel so far to burn it later. But there's no doubt cruising high uses less fuel than getting off the ground. So there are trade-offs. But rule of thumb, if you're flying from 
where I came today, Christchurch to Auckland, it's about an hour, it's about 60 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, it is true that those emissions do break down in the atmosphere. About 60% of carbon dioxide is gone within 100 years. Trouble is, 20% of it lasts for 10,000 years. There's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today that came from a campfire by somebody in ancient Egypt. It doesn't go away entirely, and it takes a long time to go. So let's say you like the idea of offsets. You can fly, but you feel better if you buy some offsets. Originally in the Paris Agreement, the notion of an offset was to be something that was an additional, permanent, measurable, and enforceable reduction in greenhouse gases in the air. 2021, the United Nations estimated that less than 100,000 tonnes of offsets in the world met that standard. The gold plate is to take carbon dioxide out of the air and store it in the geosphere in carbonates, i.e. make stone. Planting trees may be one way of offsetting short-life biological emissions in the biosphere. The trouble is when you fly to offset your 60 kilograms, my 60 kilograms to fly here today, you are actually going to require three trees to grow for a year and that tree to be around for centuries to come to store the carbon from my flight today. The airline industry is promising that it is working on low-emitting aviation fuels. One of the conundrums we see is that if we were to halve the emissions per kilometre flown, but double the number of kilometres flown, we've still got a problem. Emissions from flying are about 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Not a large proportion, you would say, but we're back to that argument that because it's little, it shouldn't matter, but it does. One of the challenges for flying is not just the level, the amount, but the rate of increase in emissions from flying. Humanity is going to have to fly less until we can figure out how to fly with no greenhouse gas emissions. But let's dial back to your sector and think about transport. Yes, you should know your numbers as a leader in the sector, as a team manager, as an event organiser, as a participant. Ignorance is no longer an excuse. Obfuscation and denial is no longer acceptable. But increasingly, businesses and business organisations are being asked not only to know and manage what are known as their scope one and scope two emissions, your emissions from being here today as part of this organisation, but scope three emissions. These are the emissions in your value chain, your supply lines and channels to market, the emissions that your activity creates or allows. So when you hold an event that drags 30,000 people to a stadium, sure, the emissions of the teams on the field do matter. But orders of magnitude bigger are the emissions of those who come to attend. So what can we think about doing, and what can you think about doing in the next two days to manage not only emissions from training and participating, as sports people, but how to own and take responsibility for the emissions that are induced by your activities from others. Should we only perform in stadia that have high quality, available and affordable public transport to them? Should we make sure that people have the option of shared transport, at least for part of their journeys. The pursuit of perfection can be the enemy of the good. Remember, every tonne reduced is worth it, 
even if you can't get to zero. If we then roll the clock forward a little, and outside of transport, think about the rest of our lives as Kiwis and New Zealanders. By the middle of this century, livelihoods that depend on high-emitting business activities, products and services, are going to be more vulnerable, more subject to disruption, and less likely to hold their social license than activities and businesses which have low emissions associated with them. Further, lifestyles that depend on high emitting activities are going to be less affordable, less desirable, and consequently are going to be the lifestyles that people wish to avoid. It is in New Zealand's own self-interests to get ahead of this game, not on average be average. The All Blacks never won a World Cup by aspiring to be the average of their competitors. So any time I hear somebody suggesting that New Zealand's best possible outcome is to be the average of our, name them, OECD, or name them, trading partners, we are committing ourselves to failure. The new and emerging business practices, lifestyles, technologies, and opportunities are going to be associated with lower emissions than the average. Whether you're a farmer, a sports organizer, a government, or a business. And as a consequence, knowing your number and figuring out what you can do is important. So is anybody left standing up? You can sit down. Because what is it that we can actually do? The first thing is you're doing it now by listening to me berate you. You are acquiring knowledge. It's actually not hard to find. Some of the major news agencies are now running fact-checking services for free. All you have to do is Google it, but make sure you're not down a rabbit hole. So, knowing some stuff is important. Secondly, talking about it is important. So I commend the conference organizers for making it a theme for your getting together today. Further, what you buy is a vote for that thing to be replaced on the shelf. If you stop buying it, it'll stop being produced. If you keep buying it, it will keep turning up. Increasingly, young people are associating themselves with businesses and activities that have values around sustainability. Young people have leverage in who they choose to work for and how they influence those organizations. Don't underestimate the angst and passion that the younger generation feel for making this a sustainable and livable planet. Now on adaptation, because we sure as heck need to reduce our emissions, and it is in our own self-interest to be a part of the future, not behind the curve. We want to invent those technologies and live those lifestyles. Little factoid, the Ministry of Health put out a report where they estimated that Ground-level pollution from the combustion of fossil fuels and motor vehicles was directly or indirectly implicated in the death of 3,500 New Zealanders every year as a result of lung disease. We breathe this crap. It doesn't matter whether you're in India or China. It does matter that you're in New Zealand. There are now known technologies that we can choose to adopt and known behaviors that we can choose to take up that will make our lives better next year, not in centuries to come. But the world is going to be a warmer place. Sadly, that is true. 
The last conference of the parties to the Paris Agreement was desperate to keep 1.5 degrees as a goal alive. But it's pretty clear the scientific community are writing in increasingly large footnotes, unlikely. That the aggregate of all the commitments, if met, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions would see average temperatures rise by about 2.8 degrees this century. And it's not entirely clear all those commitments are going to be met. So adaptation is about getting real about things we think are weather. Weather is kind of the noise in the system. Global warming and climate change is the signal, which is sometimes obscured by noise. Auckland looks like it's going to need to retrofit itself as a monsoon city. This is not a matter of keeping the drains clean. That would possibly be good in some streets. But the reality is, take a city I know, Christchurch. The last eight years, the climate has changed as if Christchurch moved north by 30 kilometers every year. The climate from the tropics is coming south at a reasonably rapid rate. But just when we got used to all of the wet, El Nino might come along and throw us back in parts of New Zealand some droughts and fires. So adapting to climate change first requires you to have an honest view about the fact that the climate is changing and it's not just weather. And it's not about averages. It's about the frequency and severity of climate chaos. Outdoor sports events are likely to be more disrupted more often. You need to accept that and plan for it rather than hope it won't happen to your event on the day. Hope is not a strategy. We are going to have to have more controlled environments for what used to be reasonably reliable outdoor events. That may mean more capital intensity or better use of the existing infrastructure we have built. We are incredibly wasteful. It's estimated the average car remains idle for 96% of its available hours. Think about our stadia across the world and in New Zealand. How do we use them better rather than always expect to build a better one? When it comes to adaptation in the broader construct, how do we make sure wider communities are going to have access to the kind of infrastructure that will be critical in the warmer and wetter world that we have created? How do you contemplate living in Sydney when by 2050 it is estimated there will be 50 days a year over 40 degrees? or in Dubai, where there'll be 40 days over 55 degrees Celsius. Planning for that is going to take time. Waiting and delaying is likely to increase costs enormously. I'm optimistic. Why am I optimistic? Partly because I'm now convinced it is in our own self-interest to prepare, to adapt, and to reduce our emissions. I don't have to wait and rely on Europe, China, India, or the United States to do stuff, although I observe they are beginning to do stuff at pace and scale. What I know is we will be better off if we get on with this now. It is also true that not all costs and losses as a result of the climate change we will experience can be compensated for. And increasingly, it is obvious they cannot be insured against in the private market. Indeed, Allstate Insurance, one of America's largest insurers, is writing no new 
homeowner policies in California exposed to climate. No wildfire cover, no flood cover, no storm cover for your housing. Similarly, in Florida, major insurers are withdrawing the offer at any price of insurance cover. That has pretty significant implications for banks that lend on the assumption they are not the residual risk holder when things go wrong. So over the next two days, as you ponder the opportunities and the challenge for creating the lowest possible emissions, not only from the activities that you promote and support, but from those who engage and participate, both as sports participants, but also as audiences. How do we make sure we know about, talk about, and mitigate emissions while we adapt to the new and challenging world? I've thrown you a lot of questions. The little clock here tells me I've got 10 minutes and 11 seconds to answer your questions. So, I am going to ask our MC to come back on stage because they'll be able to actually see if any of you throw up a hand or stand up. And yes. you can be my spotter. We actually have a, uh, an app, Dr. Carr, that we're using. So for those of you who do have that app downloaded, feel free uh, to throw a question in there. And if you actually don't even know what you're doing with the app, just throw your hand up. And it's okay. I've got some runners on. I can run around um, if you have any questions. At the beginning of this... Um, we talked about the fact that we have these keynote speakers with us today as an opportunity for you to tap into and an opportunity where you may not actually have uh, the chance to throw questions directly at somebody like Dr. Carr. So please make the most of our guest our keynote speakers while we have them. Dr. Carr, thank you for that. Uh, my question... Uh, <coughs> If we um, do all the good things, how quickly can we repair the damage for New Zealand? Oh. Um, one of the things scientists are worried about is what's called tipping points, cascading effects, irreversibility. Um, <clears throat> and it is pretty clear that, that they yet do not know where these tipping points and cascading effects happen. Last year I was involved in um, a group of 18 people who were giving advice to the Secretary General of the United Nations on greenwashing. Um, and he just got back from Pakistan where 32 million people had been displaced by flooding and 30% of the country was underwater long enough for the seed to die in the ground. And he said, while people are focused on flooding today, within 30 years the glaciers that feed the rivers of the Indus Valley will be gone. And that's the water those communities rely on for agriculture and drinking. New Zealand is not in that predicament, and I don't know what advice I would give in Pakistan. Possibly leave. In New Zealand, we are blessed with choice, but choice always requires you to act. I'm not certain we can ever put it back how it was. Our glaciers are going very quickly and will be gone in our lifetime. The reality for the planet is reversibility will require an enormous investment, in other words, foregone current consumption, in order to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, in order to stabilise temperatures. Net zero 2050 is a waypoint particularly as we're likely to overshoot plus two degrees for a second half of the century where we will have to sacrifice production of goods and services we like in order to make up for the damage we have done. Sooner is better to stop the emissions. <laughs> Um, Dr. Carr, one of the questions that has popped up here, um, I guess uh, in your uh, keynote you talk about outdoor sports events will face more and more weather disruptions, you talk about better use of existing infrastructure, you talk about uh, how do we use our stadiums better, and one of our um, attendees here today wants to know, other than reducing travel and fossil fuel, what is another area where sports organisations can make changes to improve our impact 
when it comes to climate change. Yeah, so one thing we can all do is address waste, whether, whether it is small or large. When we waste stuff, whether it's energy or food, we've created emissions for no value to anyone. So whether it's energy reduction, whether it's mindfulness about food, what you consume and what you waste, all of this is helpful in reducing our emissions. So waste is enemy kind of number one because you get nothing for something. Secondly, I do think the role modeling, advocacy and leadership that is in the power of major sporting bodies in New Zealand to influence without becoming climate activists at every moment, influence consciousness in our community. We think about how we managed an anti-smoking campaign. So it took 40 years, but we went from smoking as a right, and those of you who object need to get out of my way, to smoking as something that if you choose to do it, you need to do it away from us. That has enormous health benefits for the 70% of people who might have smoked this generation who are not smoking. So when we become convinced that we can see a better life for us, our families, our communities, we will reduce emissions and adapt to climate change. But while we see it as some obligation imposed on us unfairly by others, which we have to meet at minimum cost as late as possible, we will do as little as we can get away with and be worse off ourselves for it. So, yes, the, the actions are know your stuff, talk your stuff, know what you're buying, and be prepared to adopt good practices, efficient use of resources, and talk to people about the urgency of immediate action, that every emission counts and every emission avoided makes the planet a better place. We've got questions coming in thick and fast. Uh, <laughs> now I think we'll probably have time for one or two more. Um, but this one, Dr Carr, around whether sports organisations should be reducing the distance people travel to compete and will this actually have an impact? And is it a great enough impact when it comes to this sector? Mm. So that's a really interesting question, and I don't know the numbers, but as an industry, you might want to figure this out. You've, you've got this optimization issue. Do you take the teams to the people or bring the people to the teams in terms of active participants watching and being watched? So it may actually have a lower carbon footprint to have more distributed events where the emissions for the players and participants are higher, but the emissions for the audiences and crowds are lower. So the overall footprint of hosting that event is smaller. I don't know the answers, and I don't know where and which ones would apply to. But once you embrace and own the emissions of the people who come to watch, you've got another lever and responsibility about making that choice. Secondly, we do know that if you're going to go somewhere, try and make the most of being there. And I know for sports participants going overseas, this is a real challenge, being away from home and family and community for extended periods of time so that you can be local and play local. But again, knowing and being thoughtful about those numbers is better than saying, there's nothing I can do. I'm not responsible for the emissions of the crowds who are drawn by my event. You are responsible for the emissions of the crowds that are drawn by your event. So over a whole season, what are the emissions associated with that particular program of events? And if you know that number and make it a pragmatic policy to reduce it over time, you're doing what you can. It won't go to zero, but less is better and sooner is better. Um, I think this is our final, um, Dr. Carr, um, around the emerging technology and what should we be looking at to assist in terms of that emerging technology um, with our uh, reduction in emissions? So look, there's lots of things going on in technology. One is the technology for measuring this stuff is getting much better. 
and, and if you can measure stuff accurately and shoot it home to individual households or individual activities or individual businesses, then all of a sudden you've got a target or a number that you can look to manage and show improvement. In terms of gee whiz technologies, in energy, we now have mainly invented all of the technologies we need to decarbonize electri electricity production. And yet, 80% of coal that is combusted in the open air is used today to make electricity, and it makes about a third of all the electricity made on the planet. We need to stop doing that now, and we have the known technologies to do it. In transport, we now have known technologies that reduce whole-of-life emissions for privately owned and operated vehicles. However, the best way to reduce those emissions turns out to be shared transport, biking and walking, and living close to where you live, learn, and earn. And that requires and does reward different types of urban form. Further, we know that there are different emissions profiles from different sources of protein. A kilogram of red meat or beef, lamb, has about 20 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions. A kilogram of milk solids, about 10 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions. And a kilogram of white meat, pork or chicken, about five kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions. World Health Organization says we need about 55 grams of protein per person per day on average. China's at 70 grams of protein. The US at 120 grams of protein. China gets only 5% of its every daily protein from animal products. There are many different diets which would be associated with a very different emissions profile. So, know what you eat, eat what you know. Kia ora. <laughs>